Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us live today. And hello also to those who are watching on Catch Up. Um, I'm really delighted to have you with us for this webinar on child poverty and households with a disabled family member in Scotland. I'm delighted so many have joined us today for this event and the interest um, in these topics is, is really significant to see. My name is Rex Spallan and I work with the Improvement Service to support local authorities and health boards in their work on child poverty at local level. Families with a disabled household member are much more likely to experience poverty in Scotland. Overall, 42% of children in relative poverty between 2017 and 2020 were in a family with at least one disabled person. The reasons for this are multifaceted and we'll be exploring some of those um, today. As we start today, I think it's really important to remember that the UK has a long and evolving legislative framework that supports the concept that human beings have rights and that these rights need to be protected. Going back a little in time, one of the most substantive steps in equality for disabled people came in the form of the Disability Equality Act in 1995, which established individual rights for disabled people to claim and measures to achieve substantive equality included the duty to make a reasonable adjustment for a disabled person. In 2010, the Equality Act brought together more than 116 separate pieces of legislation into one single act, making a new streamlined legal framework to protect the rights of individuals and advance equality of opportunity for all. Fundamentally, the Equality Act is there to ensure that everyone, whether at work or using a service, has the right to be treated fairly. It protects people from discrimination on the basis of certain characteristics, and these are known as the protected characteristics. Disability, which we'll be talking about today, is one of those protected characteristics. Really importantly, the Act introduces the public sector equality duty, which falls on lists of public bodies, so organisations like local authorities, police, NHS, fire and education authorities. And this brought a significant change and new focus to equality work within the public sector in Scotland, and it moved from a passive approach to equality work to one that was proactive and cross-cutting in all aspects of day-to-day -day work um, of those organisations. The public sector equality duty is comprised of two elements, a general duty and a specific duty. And if we focus on the general duty, we can see that there's a core purpose to that duty. And that means that public bodies should really think about equality as part of their day-to-day -day business. And in particular, with the need to remove or to reduce disadvantages suffered by people because of a protected characteristic, to meet the needs of people with protected characteristics, and thirdly, to encourage people with protected characteristics to participate in public life and other activities. The Child Poverty in Scotland Act 2017 also places a duty on local authorities and territorial health boards, and this focuses on reporting annually on the activity they are taking or will take to tackle child poverty at local level. This takes the form of a local child poverty action report. Importantly, the Act also sets out that a local child poverty action report must describe any measures taken to support children living in a household whose income is adversely affected or whose, ex whose expenditure has increased because a member of the household has one or more of the protected characteristics, including disability. For those working in the public sector, it is, and especially for local authorities and health boards, it is vital that these two pieces of legislation are considered together and that evidence of need is shared across both agendas, whether that be in setting equality outcomes or in deciding on actions to address child poverty locally. So today, I'm really delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel of speakers who will share their research and their insights into the experiences of households with a disabled family member in Scotland. This will help us to better understand how and why these households are more likely to experience child poverty and therefore to think through the steps we can take to reduce that locally and take action locally. This session is being um, recorded and this will be available after the event along with all of the slides and presentations that you'll hear today. We'll also have time after the speakers for questions so please use the chat function within um, your on your screens to record any questions and we'll pick these up after the speakers. So first of all, I'm really delighted to be joined by Gillian A. Church, a senior social researcher with the Scottish Government, and she's going to take us through her recent research into the correlation and connection between child poverty and disability in Scotland. And so Gillian, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you for that intro. That was really helpful. Um, so yeah, as Rebecca said, I'm um, I'm a researcher in Scottish Government, um, and I'm going to give an overview today of um, a project that we did earlier this year to um, take a more in-depth look at child poverty in these families. 
Um, next slide, please. So um, today I'm going to, um, I guess, firstly reiterate some of what Rebecca said there about why this is a really important topic. Um, I will tell you briefly about where the data that I'm talking about has come from. We'll have a quick look at the poverty rates over time for these families. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we know about these families. And then we'll spend the majority of the time talking about the different drivers of child poverty. Um, so we use three drivers when we're thinking about child poverty, which are income from employment, cost of living and income from social security. So those are the key drivers that we need to tackle um, if we want to uh, reduce child poverty in Scotland. And I'll be talking through each of those in turn in relation to these families. And then I'll just um, sum up at the end with some key points. Thank you. So I think it's really important just to say, um, to sort of summarize what a high proportion of families we're talking about here. So overall around a third of families in Scotland include at least one disabled member. So that's a really high proportion of all families. Um, when I say families here, I'm talking about um, households where there's a, dis a dependent child. Um, and so 27% of families include a disabled adult, around one in 10 have a disabled child, and in 6% of families in Scotland, so that's around one in 20, there are both adults and children who are disabled. Next slide, please. And then in bearing that in mind, we can see that um, when we look specifically at children who are in relative, well, in different kinds of poverty, um, they make up an even higher proportion, um, these, the children from these families. So um, amongst all children in Scotland who are in relative poverty, 42% of them, as Rebecca said earlier, are in a family where someone is disabled, at least one person. So um, we're talking there about around 100,000 children. Uh, there's a similar proportion for those in absolute poverty. And then um, the bottom section on this graph shows um, children who are in combined low income and material deprivation. So that means that they struggle to afford some essential goods and services. And that's an even higher proportion of the ch those children are in these families where someone's disabled. Um, and that's quite striking. And we think this is probably related to the extra costs that families with a disabled member face, which can then make it harder for them to afford some essential goods and services that they need. Um, I think, uh, so that, that kind of summarizes why this is a really key group um, to think about when we're thinking about tackling child poverty and important family type. Um, Rebecca touched on this, but I think it's important probably just to quickly define what we're meaning here when we say someone who's disabled. So we're talking about the Equality Act definition, as Rebecca said. So um, that is someone who has a long-term mental or physical health condition. Um, when we say long-term, we mean generally around 12 months or more. That's what we ask about when we ask in our national surveys, the question we ask to define disability. Um, and then it needs to be a condition that limits people's daily activities. So in our national surveys, we ask a two-stage question. We ask if people have a condition which it has lasted or is expected to last 12 months or more. And then we ask them, does this condition limit your daily activities in a significant way? And if they say it limits their activities a little or a lot, then we would count them as being disabled. But it is important, I think, to remember that not all of these people would necessarily identify themselves as being disabled. And these are the people that we capture in our in our statistics and in our data and poverty rates. Thanks, Lynn. Next slide, please. So um, the data that I'm just going to, the evidence that I'm going to talk through today um, is, is based on an evidence review that we conducted earlier this year which just brought together a lot of information um, from different sources into one place. Um, and then we also conducted some semi-structured interviews with parents from these families. Um, the intention of doing that was to further explore some of the barriers that we knew existed for these families, to start to understand a bit better some of the gaps in our evidence, and also just to really build up a richer picture of lived experience for these families. So to really understand for individual people um, what their lives were like and how different um, difficulties that they face um, intersected for them. Next slide, please. So we spoke as part of this, we spoke to 12 different parents. Um, it was a mix of men and women. Um, it was a mix of, of parents who were disabled themselves or who had a disabled child. 
um, many lone parents, a mix of urban rural. All of the people we spoke to had school aged children. And um, so we didn't speak to anyone with younger children than that. Um, and it's, as I said earlier, it, it sort of echoed that finding that not everyone will identify themselves as disabled. So these were people who had been identified through a previous survey as meeting those criteria and they were all low income, but they didn't all see themselves or their children as being disabled. Next slide, please. Thanks. So um, this graph shows um, poverty rates over time. So um, we're looking here at the last 25 years. And the top line here is um, if for families where there's someone who's disabled, and the bottom line is for all children. Um, so you can see here that currently 24% um, of all children in Scotland are living in relative poverty. And for children in families where someone's disabled, that's 29%. Um, you can see that over the last 25 years, the rates have declined um, somewhat for both groups. But over the last 10 years or so, they've stayed um, broadly stable. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, we also know that um, having a disabled adult in the household tends to um, make it slightly more likely that the family might be in poverty. So for, for families where there's a disabled adult, the relative poverty rate is 30% and where there's a child, um, 27%. So that's likely to do with um, the fact that it's it's parents who will be bringing in income from employment into families. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of what else we know about these families, um, a lot of you might know that we have six priority groups, priority family groups for tackling child poverty. Um, and there's a significant amount of overlap between these. So a huge number of children um, will be in more than one of these family types. And when we're thinking about families where someone's disabled, there's a particular overlap with lone parent families and with large families. So those are families where there are three or more children. So around or just over a third of children who are in a family where someone's disabled are also in a lone parent family and or also in a family with um, three or more children. Next slide, please. Um, and we don't have figures specifically for, um, for the conditions that are, are that the disabled people who are in these families in, in relative poverty face, but if we're looking at the overall population, the most common um, long-standing illnesses among disabled people as a whole in 2019 were mental health conditions, respiratory conditions and musculoskeletal conditions. So that could be helpful to bear in mind. I think um, when we're talking about tackling child poverty and especially for this family group, um, the, the barriers that people face can vary hugely depending on their specific characteristics, obviously. And, um, and for this particular group, the barriers can be really different depending on the conditions that people have. So these are perhaps some of the, the biggest groups to think about. Next slide, please. OK, so um, some of you might be familiar with this. As I mentioned earlier, we have these three key drivers that we think about when we're thinking about tackling child poverty in Scotland. These are the areas that we need to look at if we're trying to reduce poverty rates. So that's income from employment, costs of living and income from Social Security. So I'm just now going to talk through each of these in turn and look at how um, these drivers, uh, what barriers these drive there might be to these drivers for this particular family group. Next slide, please. OK, so this um, this chart represents all children who are in relative poverty in Scotland. Those who are in blue are in uh, children who's in, who are in a family where there's a disabled person. Um, if you look at the top, the, the two boxes on the far left, so that's the one that says parent couple, at least one in paid work and single parent in paid work, those represent um, the children who are in a family where someone's disabled and at least one um, adult is in employment. So I think this really just goes to show that having any employment is not enough to stop families from falling into relative poverty. So um, around three fifths of children in relative poverty in these families do have someone who's in employment in the household. So it doesn't, it's not enough to find any employment. It's, it has to be that people um, have employment where they are earning enough per hour and they have enough hours to work. Uh, next slide, please. So we know that disabled parents um, are far less likely to be employed and in particular women. 
So overall, um, in 2019, 88% of non-disabled parents were in employment. We're talking here about people who are of working age. But that dropped to 73% for disabled fathers and 53% for disabled mothers. So that's a huge um, employment gap that we have there. We also know that disabled parents are more likely to be underemployed in terms of hours and skills. So in terms of hours, that means that they say that they would like to work more hours for the same rate of pay. And in terms of skills, we're talking about people who have a degree level qualification, but they are working in um, low or medium skilled occupations. So disabled parents are more likely to be underemployed in that way. We also know that adults in low income families where there's a disabled member tend to work somewhat fewer hours. So 22 hours a week on average, compared to 24 for all low income families um, amongst those who are in employment. Next slide, please. So um, amongst those who, who aren't in employment or who perhaps who also who are, but would like to do more hours, um, they face a range of different barriers. And um, these are some of the ones that are perhaps most key that we came across as being most important. So um, difficulties with transport, so that can be around just having transport that allows you to access employment. Um, inaccessible job adverts and application processes. Discrimination, um, a lack of flexible working. So um, flexible working is really important for all parents. But in particular, for families where someone's disabled, it can be um, especially important to take care of health needs and to be able to work around your health needs but also in terms of caring. So for parents who, who have a disabled partner or a disabled child, they need to be able to find employment where they can, they can be flexible and, and meet their caring responsibilities as well as their employment. Um, a lack of adequate support and also effects on benefits. So um, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, this is a case study from one of the interviews that we did and um, we've changed the person's name and some details but this is essentially their story and I think this just demonstrates some of the um, really complicated and, and intermingled barriers that people can face and the, the decisions that they have to make when they're thinking about how to increase the employment for their, the income sorry in their family. So Joanne was um, a single parent and she has two children. She had a health condition herself and so did one of her children. And she was also taking care of uh, another relative who's disabled. So she had a, quali uh, you know, a high qualification. She was a qualified social worker, but she couldn't currently work in that role because it, she couldn't find a post um, to use her qualification that would fit around her caring responsibilities. So she was working part time in her child's school, which fit in with, um, with taking care of her child and taking her child to school. Um, but she didn't think that the school was meeting her child's needs. So she had identified another school in the area that she thought might be better for her child to go to. But she was also thinking about the fact that if she moved her child to a different school, she was going to have to give up her job in, in their current school. In addition, most of her income was coming from Social Security. Um, and she had thought about taking on some more part time work, which she felt like she did have the capacity to do. But she knew that if she took any more hours on, she wouldn't be eligible for care, her carer's allowance any longer. So. These are all the things that she was thinking about when she was, you know, trying to think about how she might be able to increase her income. Um, next slide, please. So we know that skills and qualifications are an important part of finding well paid work and keeping well paid work. Um, and this is an area where there, there is quite a difference for disabled people. So we know that um, disabled parents are much more likely to have low or no qualifications. So 17% of disabled parents had low or no qualifications in 2019, compared to 7% of non-disabled parents. And then if we trace that back further, we can we know that at school, disabled school leavers are less likely to have one or more pass, SCQF level five or better. We know that disabled school pupils tend to have slightly lower attendance. And we also know that disabled pupils are more likely to be excluded from school. So this just really shows that, um, you know, the difficulties that people face from a young age and that, you know, it's important to tackle these differences from, from school level all the way through um, when we're thinking about people who are going to go on to become future parents. Next slide, please. 
It's also um, really important when we're thinking about this um, type of family in particular to understand that employment is not um, realistic for some families. It's not something that they can take on either now or, or in the long term sometimes. So this can be often because of their own health needs or because of their caring responsibilities. So for these families, we need to think about the other two drivers. We need to tackle poverty through reducing costs of living and through increasing their income from social security and benefits in kind. What we mean by that is, is things like free school meals and, and things where, um, where families uh, will receive money in a different form. Um, and we can also um, think about formal and in informal health and care support. So that's another thing which can be really important for these families to enable them to, to increase their income or reduce their cost of living. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk now about childcare and then also transport. So these are two areas, um, what we would call enablers. So they're things that can um, be very important in allowing parents to access employment, but they're also important in reducing families' costs of living. And we know that these are two things which are particularly important in these areas. So in terms of childcare, the families with um, where someone has a long-term condition, so that doesn't necessarily mean disabled, but where there's a long-term condition in the family, and um, we know that they can find it harder to afford childcare. We also know though that many parents um, prefer to use informal childcare, and that includes many of the people we spoke to. So we know, so informal childcare means either they want to take care of their children themselves, and they don't want to use um, formal childcare, or they might want their friends or family to do that for them. So some parents told us that they just thought that they were the best placed person to take care of their child and to, to do all the childcare, and they didn't want to use any kind of formal childcare. However, there are also other people who, um, who couldn't find formal childcare, although they would like it. So for some people, that was that it just didn't exist where they lived. And for other people um, where they had disabled children, it might have been that there was formal childcare available, but it couldn't meet the needs that their children had. Next slide, please. Um, and in terms of transport, we know that overall disabled and non-disabled adults in low-income families have similar levels of transport satisfaction. There's not a statistically significant difference there in the, in the satisfaction levels. But we do know that disabled people face specific barriers. So these can include um, difficulties getting information about travel. Um, not being able to travel spontaneously, so maybe having to book travel further in advance. Um, infrequent or inaccessible forms of transport, especially buses uh, and other accessibility issues, uh, lack of priority seating or it already being taken, um, and safety and comfort concerns that they face as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to cost of living, which is our second driver. Um, we know that um, spend on housing and food for families where someone's disabled is broadly similar um, compared to families where there isn't a disabled person, but spend on fuel can be higher. And overall, we know that disabled people face um, a whole range of extra costs, and this can really vary hugely in, in the type of costs and the amount um, between families. So um, to give one example, someone that we interviewed um, was talking about how and she had to buy uh, extra food, bedding, toweling and electricity. So her child um, was wetting the bed, so she was constantly showering. So they had to replace the sheets and mattresses quite often. And she also had violent tendencies as well. So they had to keep replacing furniture. So I think this just kind of illustrates the, the very broad range of things that people can have to pay more for um, if they have a disabled person in the household. And again, that won't be the case for all families, but for many it is. Um, when, we're to, when we calculate our poverty rates, um, so the ones we looked at earlier, we don't um, take account of the extra costs that these families face because it can be very different for each family. It's, it's difficult to do that. But what we can do is we know that disability benefits that people receive are designed to take account of extra costs that disabled people face. So one way of kind of trying to account for the extra costs that these families have when we calculate poverty rates is to subtract the income that they get from disability benefits from their income when we're calculating poverty rates. So if we do that, we can see that poverty rates for families where someone's disabled rise quite sharply. 
So relative poverty for, for children in these families is 29%. But if we subtract the income from disability benefits to take account of the fact that that's going to be paying for extra costs they have, then the relative poverty rate for these families rises to 34%. Um, next slide, please. Um, so finally, to look at the third driver, which is social security. This is a complicated area. Um, currently, it's split between um, reserved and devolved agencies. So, so many benefits that these families receive will be delivered by the UK government. And then um, more are starting now to be delivered by Social Security Scotland. We do know that um, many uh, families with a disabled person have difficulties with the benefits. So disability benefits currently are still delivered by the UK government. We know that they ex people experience a range of difficulties with these. And some of the key ones that people um, talk about are a lack of advice and support, um, having a lack of trust in the system, and a, a complex and inflexible application process. And I think in particular for a lot of disabled people, it's it's around when they have conditions that don't change and that they aren't likely to change, but they have to keep reapplying for benefits anyway. And I think a lot of people find that hard to understand why they have to keep doing that. Um, so currently, um, Scottish Government is in the process of preparing to start delivering disability benefits in Scotland. Um, and that we're working to try and understand these problems and to address them, to think how we can reduce these barriers for people when they start being delivered in Scotland. So this is something um, that we need to just monitor over the next few years. We'll see how, how this goes. Um, and we've got evaluation plans in place to see if things can improve when they come to Scotland and, and what more we might be able to do to improve this for these families. Um, next slide, please. So just to conclude, um, some of the key points, I think, when we're thinking about child poverty and families where some are disabled, um, it's to bear in mind that they face um, additional barriers into and in the labour market. So that's getting employment and then also staying, being able to stay in employment. Um, flexible work is important for all parents, but particularly for parents in these families, it's really invaluable. Um, we know that disabled people face barriers to getting skills and qualifications. So tackling this is also really important in addressing the employment gap. We know that for others, um, for some parents who are disabled or who have a disabled family member, um, employment is not a realistic option. Um, and so we need to, to think about that in reducing cost of living and increasing employment from social security when we're trying to lift these families out of poverty. We know that costs are higher for disabled families. And as I said, um, when disability benefits are subtracted from incomes, we see that child poverty rates rise further. Overall, there isn't one clear lever for tackling child poverty among um, families where someone's disabled. So every family is highly unique, um, not, not least in the fact that the barriers and difficulties people face can, can really vary depending on who in the family is disabled and what conditions they might have. But there's just, you know, every every family is different. Um, and so we really need to help understand on an individual level what, what each family might need. However, having said that, I think um, stability and flexibility in all areas, so work, care, support and income packages are really important for these families. Um, and I haven't really had time to, to speak about this much in this presentation, but it's also really important to bear in mind the impact that COVID has had. So COVID has been really difficult for these families and it's had a lot of impact. Um, and that is likely to have ongoing effects um, in the next few years. So the effect that that pandemic has had for these families and what that might mean, it's also really important to think about um, when we continue our work on tackling child poverty going forwards. Um, final slide, please. So just to say thanks very much for um, listening. I hope that was helpful. Um, I've put a link here to the report, that um, the full report, where you can you can read more about um, what I've outlined today. Um, and we've also previously done in-depth looks at two of our other priority family types. So those are lone parents, families, and minority ethnic families. So um, I think that the slides will be circulated, and those links are there to those reports as well, if that's something you'd be interested in. And um, yeah, please get in touch if you have any questions or um, or any comments. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jillian. That was really insightful and comprehensive overview of the three drivers. And I think a reflection of the complexity of issues faced by families with the disabled household members. So thank you very much for sharing that level of detail with us. I think it's really, really helpful as we go forward. And um, next, I want to invite Martin um, Talbot to, to present to you. Martin is a public health intelligence advisor with Public Health Scotland, and he's going to have a look at some of the local data sources that we that are available and helping us to think about where we might begin to start when we're looking at local um, manifestations of, of disability. Martin, over to you. Thanks very much, and thanks for the opportunity to present this morning. Um, next, next slide, please. So, what I thought I would cover the, this morning is just a wee bit on the kind of wider context, um, talking about some of the the broader drivers which lie behind um, what we're talking about: the the child poverty among less priority group, um, cuts to social security, inequalities and in disability uh, across Scotland, and also uh, a little bit about. Um, in employment, voice and support of work and how that might impact on these families. And then to, to move on to talk about local data, um, where, where to start, what can it tell us, the scale and distribution of these families and some of the implications for this, both in terms of um, what can it tell us about the different challenges, um, but also the opportunities that local data might give us in, in helping to meet local needs and therefore offer some conclusions. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm what I'm looking at here is um, this gives you an idea of some of the scale of uh, cuts to social security in the in the UK. Um, and the slide on the right hand side gives you um, some idea of the difference between different family family types and households where no one is disabled. Um, in those families, the the cumulative cuts are estimated to be around seventeen hundred pounds uh, per annum. But um, this rises sharply according to the number of disabled people in the household, up to more than six thousand pounds per annum. And these figures are for couple families, they're, they're rather larger for um, lone parent families. Next slide, please. So again, the, the distribution of um, disabled families across Scotland, and we'll, we'll come along uh, uh, onto this in more detail later on, um, is not distributed evenly across Scotland. Um, adults with a, a disability are more likely to be found in more deprived um, areas. This looks at uh, how this, how the, how the distribution uh, looks across Scotland. And you can see that in the the most deprived parts of Scotland, over on the left hand side there, almost half of adults who are sixteen plus have a, a, a long term limiting, long term condition. Whereas in the the upper half of the less deprived parts of Scotland. It's between a quarter and, and a third, so much lower. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as, as Gillian has mentioned, one of the, the prominent um, disabilities that adults face um, in, in Scotland is, is mental, mental health conditions, and this obviously this can vary. But w one, of the, one of the things in which I think we, c we can think about is, is the drivers of poor mental health, um, and there are a number of, of uh, things that drive poor mental health. That can include low and insecure income itself and problem debt. I mean, we know it, that in some cases, um, debt, debt in Scotland is, is actually being caused um, by debt to the public sector. Um, we also know that other factors are driving poor mental health, such as unemployment and access to, to good work. So Gillian has, has touched upon um, the importance of not just uh, any work, but the right kind of work, and also other factors which are at least partly within the control of um, local, local authorities and uh, other local stakeholders, such as 
housing and the physical environment, um, that can have a, a, a positive or negative contribution to uh, mental health. So areas to consider there. Um, next, next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted also to talk about um, just expanding that uh, a little um, uh, and talk about um, the employment context. So uh, there's some good evidence that uh, being supported at work um, um, can have a, an important role um, in keeping people employed, particularly good employment. Um, but what the, we know from some of the data is that where adults have a disability, they are less likely to report that they are consulted about change at work compared to adults who aren't disabled. And they're more likely to agree that relationships at work are strained and more likely to disagree that their line manager encourages them. So they, there could be questions there about um, whether uh, employers and uh, managers could be doing more um, to support disabled adults in work to avoid leaving that um, uh, work because of a lack of support or because they're not fully supported in employment with a risk to uh, poverty uh, for them and their families. So next uh, slide, please. Thank you. So while local data um, is limited, I think um, it's important to say that it can provide some some potential insights. And some of the, the sources that are available, um, we can highlight. That includes, for example, the local data dashboard, which is available on the Scottish Government website. The resource in the, that we've recently published on Public Health Scotland uh, website with a, a range of data sources. And also increasingly, the Department of Work and Pensions Stat Explorer website. And I highlight that because of the increasing importance of universal credit as it's rolled out for low income families. Um, that will provide some important insights into the what's happening with low income families where someone has uh, a disability and the extent to which they're being fully supported by the system. Next, next slide, please. So it isn't all about, um, well, people will know this, of course. Um, it isn't all about um, national data that's available locally, but it's all about it, it's it's also about combining uh, that kind of that type of knowledge with other types of information and expertise, and that can include, importantly, disabled families' own experience and knowledge of how things how things are actually working in practice. It can include uh, frontline staff and volunteers, their experience and knowledge. Um, local data that is held locally, so there could be examples there of uh, unique information that's being collected um, or, or held in, in various forms. Um, and other sources there, um, including, for example, the views and practices of employers. The, the other point to note is that bringing together all these different bits of the, the puzzle, if you like, can also highlight um, some of the gaps in our knowledge. For example, the, the take up uh, locally national of disability benefits and whether the, the, that disability benefits are actually paid at a level adequate to fully cover the costs of disability. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the local picture, um, it's useful to, to highlight the, the distribution across Scotland. Uh, geography matters. Um, as with uh, lone parents, um, the, the families where someone has a disability are more likely to be concentrated in older industrial parts of Scotland. Um, that includes places like Glasgow, Inverclyde, Western Bartonshire, Dundee, Lanarkshire and Ayrshire, for example, and less likely to be found in places like Aberdeen City and Shire um, and Eastern Bartonshire. Uh, next, next slide, please. And this uh, is important because if we're thinking about 
um, income from employment. And of course, as, as Dylan has highlighted, um, a number of, of parents in those households do want to work. Um, it may not be appropriate for, for in all cases, but where parents do want to work um, and, and work is flex, flexible enough, it's important to highlight the, the variability in employment rates. So for example, um, employment rates pre-COVID, this is 2019 data, were a lot lower in uh, places like say Inverclyde than they were in Aberdeen City and Shire, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So as well as the, the flexibility and the, the type of work being actually accessible, um, and indeed the, the, the quality of work being supportive of good health. Um, the geography is important because there were some places in Scotland where jobs and vacancies were simply scarcer for everyone. Um, and there's good evidence that for adults who have a disability, um, employment rates are likely to be lower where the labour market is weaker. So the red line here shows you where the, there are, there's one job for every working age adult in Scotland. This data is for 2019, so the situation's changed a bit since then. But you can see, for example, in travel to work areas such as Greenock, Motherwell and Airdrie, um, some parts of Dumfries and Galloway and um, Ayrshire and Lanarkshire, there were only two jobs for every uh, three working age adults in Scotland. So a bit of a challenge there, um, which is uh, doubly important, I think, for disabled adults who want to work. Next slide, please. So there are opportunities, I think, with local data. Um, one aspect we've been looking at is uh, the extent to which we can compare local need um, against um, which could be then be compared with the, the local action. And again, um, giving the example of employment support, for example, of Disabled Parents Employability Support Fund. Um, by combining local administrative data with uh, survey data, it could be possible to estimate the number of local disabled parents who might benefit from employment support. And that could be combined with some of the information that's already published in the local child poverty action plans of uh, disabled parents who are, who are benefiting from employability support. So that could be one way in which a, a better story could, could be told about what's happening locally and nationally um, in that area of work, income from employment. Um, and help inform uh, our knowledge of what's going on and what 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 gaps there are to. Uh, next slide, please. So just to just to conclude, um, so while local data is limited, if we combine it with other knowledge, we can perhaps help better define the scale and nature of the problem. Um, and it's important to put this in a, a wider context. Um, and that's in two senses. One is to look at the, the causes behind the causes, things like, as I mentioned, social security uh, cuts and the role of uh, employers and other institutions in making things better, perhaps. Um, and it's not just about the, the data, it's also about um, bringing in different forms of knowledge and while there's lots been done already or planned in this area nationally and locally, um, comparisons with local needs can, be help, can perhaps help tell the story more clearly and may also help identify gaps in our knowledge and inform action in these areas. Um, th thank you for your uh, time. And that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for, for sharing those um, statistics and insights with us.
Um, just a reminder that if you have any questions for um, Gillian or Martin, please use the chat function to note those down and we'll pick them up um, at um, the end of our speakers. Uh, so now I'm really delighted to have um, Sophie Pilgrim and uh, Linda Black with us. Um, Sophie is the Director of Linda's Information and Advocacy Worker of Kindred Advocacy in Scotland. I'm really delighted to have you both with us this morning to share your experiences of working with families with a disabled um, household member. And so I'm going to hand over to you just now. So thank you, Sophie and Linda. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, Kindred is a parent-led organisation and I'm parent of an adult with disabilities now. My son is 26 years old and he has autism and learning disability and he still lives at home, so we have a complex package of care for him. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that there, I think that there have been many positive developments. For example, one of which is that people have come to really sort of have a much better understanding of autism and the general public are much more knowledgeable and sympathetic towards families like my own. Um, so throughout this presentation, I've tried to highlight some positive um policy developments that have have been ongoing in scotland and um, linda and i manage our database and we 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 have a new online database well relatively new we we started up in october 2019 and we kindred support 700 families every year so we now have a really rich database and I used deception to get Linda to come along with me, but we both care very much about the, the insights that we gain from our database. And I hope that we'll be able to share those insights with you. Next slide, please. So as I just explained, Kindred supports around 700 families every year. Last year, obviously, was the full on pandemic. So these are our statistics for 2020 to 20. 21 and over 12 months we just did not stop you know our, our pace of care continued and that was despite the fact that out of 12 staff we had five furloughed we have three teams one's based in five which linda's manager of and we have a community team and we have a team based at the royal hospital for children and young people in edinburgh and um, Together, the teams over that year raised one and a half million pounds in statutory benefits, and we also raised hundreds of thousands of pounds for in grant aids for things like um, equipment and toys, specialist toys. Martin, I think, was no, it was um, Gillian was talking about children who, you know, might wet the bed and they need additional um, mattresses and sheets and so on. Those are the kind of items that Kindred raises funding for families, but it can be items like clothes. During the pandemic, we distributed vouchers for shopping for food for families as well. Um, for a child with complex needs, the additional benefits that we raise can be up as high as 22,000 in additional income per annum. And that is for children who meet that very high bar of high rate care disability and high rate mobility allowance, dis that's disability living allowance. And as you probably know, DLA is the sort of route to a range of other benefits, including carers allowance. Um, so what does Kindred do? You'll already have gathered that we do a lot of statutory benefits and grant fundraising for families, but primarily we're an advocacy organisation and that means that we look at people's situations and we support them to gather the support around them that they need. And that could be around getting respite or carers into the home. And we also support families to get the right educational provision. So our team can support families all the way up to tribunal. And it, in fact, we quite often rely on the Equalities Act because we take support families all the way to disability discrimination tribunal. Um, next slide, please. 
So I put the postcodes of 898 families from our database to the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. And this was really to show something, and this is a, the pattern I nearly always get, which is that most of our families are in quintile one, well not most, but a higher proportion in quintile one, which you see I think on the left hand side, um, and slightly higher proportion in quintile two than average and dropping. And then quintile five, interestingly, it goes up a little bit. Um, so basically we, you know, voluntary organisations like ours are quite often it's said, oh, it's articulate middle class people who access your services. And like this data disproves that. We we're more likely to work with families in areas of high deprivation. But of course, even if you live in an area which is relatively affluent, you could have low income. And we also look at whether people do have low income. And according to our stats, we have 66% across the board on low income. And that rises to 79% on low income in five. We did a survey on the impact of the pandemic, and that's available on our website if anybody wanted to look at it. And it was quite an in-depth survey, and we rang and talked to families as well. And in the end, I think we talked to 44 families. And that was quite difficult reading, and it was quite difficult to talk to those families because during the pandemic, they were so so incredibly impacted by the loss of their services. So a lot of the children need care through the night and families, quite a number of families reported back to us that they would regularly get five hours of interrupted sleep a night. And that would be because if a child is tube fed, you have to stay awake until the feed finishes because otherwise the tubes might get tangled around them. Um, if children have respiratory problems, then you sleep with a monitor right next to you and you'll have lights going off and warning um, messages. So you have to get up again to check that your child is OK. Um, next slide, please. So how is it that we reach families? You know, the question that we were asked, Rebecca asked us, was how do we provide services locally to families? In, in need of support. And I think a key thing, and Linda might touch on this as well, is referral from, from statutory professionals and partners who are meeting families, and they're the ones who identify families who are really in crisis. Uh, we, we've been established for 30 years, and we have the base at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. And that, again, is a sort of equaliser, because everybody who has a child with a significant disability in this region, including five, is likely to end up at the hospital. And therefore, it makes us accessible in an equal way to families. And I think and a factor is that the families who turn to us tend to be in crisis, and that quite often can be around the financial crisis. We offer expertise on completing disability living allowance um, Martin touched on this, the complexity of applying for statutory funding. Um, so disability living allowance for children, is the application form is 40 pages long. You need to know the right sort of phrases to use in that in order to get the right level of care. And we at Kindred did our own sort of double blind test because we had twins in fact, this was children supported by Linda. Linda completed out two disability living forms. The twins were identical. The situations were identical. The only difference was that, you know, obviously they had different names. Um, and the re re results came back. One of them got high rate care disability living allowance and the other got nothing at all. Um, so that just shows that families completing these forms themselves are up against a very big challenge. To, to, to do um, the DWP credit, 
at Kindred, when we see something like that and there's a discrepancy, we we can always challenge that and we challenge that situation in tribunal and um, invariably if we think a family have not got the right level of DLA we can then pursue the tribunal and sort it out. Because of pressure on our own resources and our staff we, we tend not, particularly in the community team, if families have completed it themselves it's very very hard for us to undo that by challenging the decision and what we tend to do is wait and then wait for the the statutory three months and then we say to families right let's do a mandatory reconsideration which means that we can no sorry not mandatory re reconsideration i'm forgetting the term but we basically start the application all over again from scratch rather than try and overturn the decision if the family filled out the form themselves Next slide. Please. So this is just an example of a family. Um, this was a family at the hospital. Dad lost his income, and Arthur's family was supported to apply for disability living allowance, child benefit, and a blue badge. And they also required support with housing and resident residency so that Arthur could be discharged from hospital. And I had a look on our database and we provided 230 hours of support for this family so that was six and a half weeks of somebody working full time and um, one big factor i think is the availability of accessible housing and to me it's a mystery why we don't build more of our housing which and make it accessible and by that you just need to have access to the doors and you need to have a wet room which anybody could use, so it doesn't have to go to a family with a child with disability. But we have a terrible lack of appropriate housing in Scotland. So just next slide, please, and just over to Linda now for a, a quick comment about families locally in Fife. Good morning. Um, I work out in the community in Fife. Um, it's a very diverse area. We have some pockets and some areas where there's quite a lot of affluent families um, and we also have a number of families who live in extreme poverty um, and high social economic problems. Um, I'm shocked. I've been out doing this job for 14 years and I'm still shocked at the severe level of poverty sometimes that I, I find with families. I can go into a family's home and find that they've got very limited resources um, they may have no floor coverings, they can't afford to heat their home. If they heat their home, they can't afford to buy food. They don't know um, where to turn. They are families that perhaps have their own challenges with um, literacy. They, they can't access the benefits that are out there. They don't know how to access them. Um, so we would go out and we would generally look at the family holistically, um, look at housing, look at benefits look at funding and do whatever we can to make that journey um, for them a little bit easier. Sophie touched on um, speaking about disability and you know the family that they supported at the hospital. We get a number of our referrals and five from our health colleagues and um, we work very closely with our health colleagues from the um, consultants right down to the health visitors, the community nurses, the OTs, speech and language, they all make referrals direct into us. We had a new referral come in last week for a family who have a new baby. Um, their middle child is 20 months and they have a toddler of about four. Um, middle child has quite severe and complex disability and can often need to be taken into hospital to have his feeding tube um, replaced two to three times a day. Mum and dad, because of his medical condition, aren't confident of, of defeating the tube. So there's quite a lot of expense just for travelling back and forward to hospital. Um, family have never claimed benefits. Uh, Dad has always worked. He, he works in quite a low paid job, but he has always maintained that he could support his family. He's worked all the hours going uh, full time, takes all the overtime that's going. Um, but now they're in a situation where they have a new baby um, a child attending nursery and a very ill middle child. Mum can't be in two places at once. 
So they've had no alternative but for dad to go down to 20 hours a week. Significantly for them, that means they really cannot keep their home, feed themselves and have the money in the car to get their child back and forward um, to hospital. As most families, they have prioritized, prioritized their Linda, we've lost your sound, sorry. No, is that you now? Sorry, did did you hear me explaining the family's history? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Just so, a few seconds. Yeah, so dad has um, never claimed benefits. They don't even claim child benefit. They've never, they've never felt the need that they wanted to to rely on the benefit system. But after a little bit of talking through things with them um, and with the health professionals that were there, we realised how much this family actually are in need of help and support. So my role then is about building up trust with the family and um, explaining to them the benefits they're entitled to and explaining to them how I can actually help. You know, They don't have to fill the forms in, I can fill the forms in for them. I can go over everything with them, I can um, advocate for them, I can do funding applications, I can look at trying to get more suitable housing for this family. So it won't be, a, it's not a quick in and out. We can very quickly in this family situation make the reference to get DLA, we can apply for child benefit for them, we can get universal credit because their income has dropped. But they are going into poverty and if it wasn't for the close relationship that we have with health this family wouldn't have known where to turn for support and that is something we see quite a lot in Fife. Um, families don't know where to go and they're not as able to access online systems as people seem to to think you know everything is said apply online but if you don't have the money to actually pay for your internet connection or you don't have the literacy skills to actually go online, then most families just end up going further into poverty rather than admitting they don't know what to do. Um, and that is just a very typical by family. That's nothing unusual that we wouldn't hear um, numerous referrals that come in on, on a weekly basis. Um, and it really is just quite shocking that in 2021, so many families are trying to look after and care for a severely disabled child and living in real poverty. And I'll just hand back to Sophie. Thanks, Linda. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. So just to finish up, oh, an obvious point to make is that the more complex the disability, the more the impact on family income. And across our, our families, about 33% of them have autism, a very over 50% are now very complex. And two areas I really just want to highlight is the children with very complex medical needs who might have nursing care overnight and children who require the top level of mental health support, top level CAMs. And we've had a huge investment into mental health, but unfortunately, children with autism and who, who really have more prolonged and um, more, more significant need, mental health needs, the, the funding for those children has actually decreased. I mean, it's something that we're really trying to sort of campaign about. Um, so, but on a positive note, self-directed support has been a real help to many families because they've been able to adapt pack packages to their own need, a downside is that with Brexit, we've, we've really seen a significant lack of carers available for families' packages. So even where there is money available, we can't find the staff for those families. But another positive is that in Scotland, we have positive behavioural support, which is really helping families with children with autism to, to understand their own children's behaviour and to manage it more effectively. So last last slide, please. 
I'm out of time, so I won't read this, but it was a quote from a family and it's an article which is going in the Herald on the 1st of October. Um, and I just finally wanted to make a point about being an employer and our, of our 13 staff, 12 have significant caring responsibilities. And something we try very hard to do is offer staff carers leave. And I know that has made a significant difference to our staff team. And I believe it's resulted in us having um, a very um, dependable and expert staff team who have who stayed with us over many years because we've been flexible to their needs. And just finally, Kindred is a charity. I, I just think the environment at the moment for charities, a lot of the funding is going through um, procurement processes and a charity like Kindred really, really struggles under that, that kind of system because we don't have the business departments to compete. So really just one appeal is, you know, to support charities like Kindred, which have a close connection with the families who we work with. Thank you. Sorry for going a bit over time. Thank you. Thank you both Sophie and Linda for sharing that, um, those experiences with us and I suppose for the reality of um, what families are going through in our communities and the impact that COVID has had on families as well in terms of interrupting those packages that were in place and the supports and services that were there that are, are so important to kind of keep going in terms of family life and managing um, everything. So we've got some time now for, for questions so I'll invite our panellists um, back and um, if anyone in um, the audience has a question for any um, panellists please let us um, please add that to the chat function um, and we can get those um, to them. I suppose a, a question for, for um, Linda, um, if you were to kind of, I suppose, start out in a journey of trying to engage with some families who have um, a stable member, where would you, where would you recommend someone might start? So, you know, you're, you're working in a local authority and you want to do something around this agenda, where would you, where would you suggest someone start? I've been um, looking at how to refer into our, our organisation or or just, just more generally, if you were to, to try and, um, I suppose, just engage with families to find out what might be going on for them. Is there particular services or particular points in someone's journey that would be good to, to speak to them? Yeah, we, we find in Fife that we have a, a very close link with um, colleagues in health. So we pick up um, quite often um, from the neonatal team before babies have even left hospital that we've got a child with severe and complex need. Um, the services vary throughout Fife and that's I think part of the difficulty we have is because Fife is such a large area there are perhaps services that are available up in the east that aren't available in the central and the west and it can be quite confusing I think for professionals to know you know where to go to. Most of the professionals health and social work um, know about Kindred and do refer and a lot of head teachers actually refer into us as well we're, we're widely known. Um, so they will tend to phone us up and just run things by us and say, or do you know of another agency that might be of help? But it is a bit of a minefield. And I think with COVID, a lot of smaller organisations that were available um, in little localities just didn't survive their, their funding. So it is quite difficult at the moment. There isn't a lot of services out there. Um, but if any professional wants to refer in, they can just refer, they can just pick up the phone and give us a call. There's not a complex form or anything to fill in. Thank you, Linda. And there's a question that had come in whether you took referrals from education professionals, but I think you've you've covered that one and that one there. Um, in terms of kind of local authorities and health boards looking at data that they might already have, um, do you have um, any advice on how they might begin to kind of disaggregate that that data? Um, maybe Gillian or Martin could tackle that one. So it might be data that they held held around housing or food banks or whatever it might be. How would how would you recommend they would think about disaggregating that for disability? Um. 
Julian, do you want to? Yeah, I think that might be one for Martin if he's still here. I'm not. I'm not sure if he's still on the call. Um. So hi there. Um. I. I think. I mean, it is. Uh, it's 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 the the national data that's available locally is quite limited, but I suppose as a, a it might be it might be worthwhile just um uh, looking at how that varies with within local local areas um as well as as well as just having a, a, a headline figure. Um, the other thing that I'll maybe I'll maybe come back I'll, I'll maybe follow I'll maybe follow this up, but there's there's some work going on at the moment looking at how data might be better use might be made of data linkage. But I'll maybe I'll, I should maybe think think about that and maybe would it be alright if I came back? Um, mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, well, is that okay? Absolutely, that, Martin. Okay. I think oh, um, sorry. lots of local authorities will and and health boards will do equality monitoring for their services anyway. So it's maybe about thinking about some of those categories that um, or tools and templates that are used across other services that um, record things like ethnicity and disability, gender, that kind of thing, and just making sure that if your service is targeted at people who are experiencing poverty, that you you undertake that same type of segregation um, for these types of services. So just I suppose, thinking about how you would, uh, the questions that you want to ask and whether they're relevant to the service that you're delivering, and then how you're gonna record and use the information um, at the end of that. So. Um, I think that's one of the things that we could you could think about if you wanted to segregate your your data. Okay, um, Dylan, you mentioned that the Scottish um, Social Security system is is changing, and we've got a new payments around um, child disability coming very very soon. Um, can you talk a little bit about what some of the opportunities you think that might bring for families? Um, yeah, I mean, I should say I this is not my area of expertise particularly. Um, I have colleagues who work uh, do research specifically on social security, and that's their area of expertise. But I think um, we we do have a reasonable amount of of evidence about issues that have been faced around social security over the last five ten years, and I think um, I know the colleagues are trying to really take account of that um, and I think there's a particular focus on service delivery and how it can be improved um, when when benefits start to be delivered in Scotland so um, I hope that we will see significant improvements um, I think that yeah it's over the next um, year or two I think that they're gradually going to be introduced so I think we need to just wait and see and and I know there are some proper evaluation plans in place and there's a big monitoring framework so um yeah we will have good data to see if that is improving and and what changes we can see um martin also touched on take up um again which is something that we maybe don't know as much about at the moment just because we don't have um we don't we don't have the data to tell us exactly how many people are eligible for some of these benefits at the minute um which means that we don't necessarily know um, in detail, how what the proportion of people who are eligible for stuff are are receiving the benefits that they're entitled to. So I think that's another area for improvement as well. And I know there's a strategy being put, being developed at the minute to improve our data there and to improve take up. So I think that's another area that really needs some work. Great, thank you, Gillian. Um, and a question for uh, Sophie, um, and it's around how you encourage um, staff to disclose disability where people might feel uncomfortable in doing that. How would you encourage employers to say, you know, it's okay to disclose your disability um, and any any tips or, or help that you can um, offer because you seem to do that quite successfully? Yes, I think, um, I know, I think it it's a sort of 
changing culture really, isn't it? I mean, the obvious thing is that you show the way by talking about, you know, as, as I did at the beginning of the presentation, um, you know, talking about, you know, if, if, if um, people who are managing teams talk about their own circumstances, definitely I found that because we have a very supportive environment, you know, that's helped me because when I need time off with my own family, I never have to feel uncomfortable about that. So that's something extremely valuable to me. So I think it's about maybe, you know, a simple tip would be to ask if there's a member of staff who would talk about their own caring role. Um, because I, I think giving people flexibility, I just, I think that's just such a sort of obvious benefit to offer. And I would say to nearly all employers, you know, you get that back because people are grateful for, for, for getting that flexibility. So they're more prepared to be focused and committed when, when they are at work. Definitely. Thank you, Sophie. That's really helpful. Um, we don't have any more questions coming through from, from our audience, but I'll give it another minute or so just to see if anything else comes through. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to say a very big thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, Julian, Martin, Sophie and Linda, thank you for your time and for your insights into the work that you have, have done and continue to do around um, disability and poverty in Scotland. I think it's really important that we talk about these issues and people have access to the information that will help them to kind of take this forward, whether they're working in equalities or working um, on child poverty specifically or just more generally and a range of services that are, that are out there. So thank you so much um, for sharing um, what you've shared with us today. Um, as I said earlier, we will be sharing the recording of the webinar and all of the supporting materials, presentations and, and links as well. Um, so you'll find those on the Improvement Service um, web pages and also on our Knowledge Hub group. If you're not part of the Knowledge Hub group, we've got a group called Taking Action on Child Poverty in Scotland. Um, on the Knowledge Hub, it's free to join and we'd love to see you there. Um, but also if you registered for the conference or for the webinar, sorry, we will um, send that automatically um, to you. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, as we've got no other questions, um, I will now close the webinar. Um, thank you for joining us and um, I hope to see you at um, some future events by the Improvement Service. So thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you.